you've made this wonderful, entertaining, funny, a little bit sad documentary about the Montserrat studio set up by Beatles producer George Martin, where a lot of big name musicians came to record some pretty important music. Now, why was it important to tell this story? Uh, I, I think it was important to tell this story because um, it's a story that focuses on the creative process. And although when we started making this film, we weren't living in a COVID world, I think now more than ever, it's important to think about how we create together, how we create in isolation um, and the ways in which that affects the creative process. Um, but, you know, also these guys are at the end of, uh, you know, an insanely long career and what people don't realise about a lot of them is the, the interpersonal relationships within the band and that's what we're really fascinated with and that's the story that we wanted to tell. Also a fascinating look at bands, especially bands that have had such a longevity. Um, you know, I always found it funny, we found it funny when Rolling Stones in the film say, you know, is this the last tour you're going to go on? And it's like 1989 and you go, it's 2021 and they're still on tour. Okay. Um, so I think it's an incredible testament to some of those bands that have just been together for so many years and are still, you know, going on doing concerts and putting down new albums. Now, Gracie, this project was brought to you by Cody Greenwood. Now, when we talk about directors, we often automatically see that as a synonym for the creator or the or, or the originator of a project. That's not really the case here, is it? Cody, can you just tell us a little bit about your background with Montserrat and the work that you did before Gracie got on board? Sure. So, um, I'd been a documentary filmmaker for a, a number of years, but then, um, had a crazy idea to make an I you know a story about Montserrat because my mum was an artist there in the 70s. She was making, you know, an incredible artwork that was influenced by the West Indies. And she was down there when Sir George Martin decided to start the studio. And so um, when all the musicians would come down, she would sell her artwork to them. And that was how she ended up making a living. Uh, so I knew knew all the stories of the island, had the idea to make the film. Um, wrote to George Martin's estate to get their permission because they, you know, there's been other teams who tried, but they really wanted a team who had a personal connection to the island and then got them on board. Um, and then it was really a two year process to get me to, to get us to the point where we could start filming. Um, and Sting was the first person who said he'd do an interview. Uh, and came on board. Um, you know, I wrote to him and he said, come to New York in two weeks' time and you can shoot me in my apartment building. Um, so that was kind of the catalyst to start it all. Gracie came in about a, a year into the two-year development period uh, and then as soon as Gracie was attached, it was just like, you know, game on. <laughs> huge research period um, and a huge financing period as well because of all the music rights. Now, Cody, just quickly, could you just tell me, though, about the moment when you said someone's going to make this movie? That moment was I was in, I'm from Perth, Western Australia, and a guy who um, was a tech at the studio, he was just sitting around a dinner table. He was having dinner with my parents and they invited me to join them. And he was talking about a story about something to do with Paul McCartney being down on the, on the island. And and then my mum piped in and she told her Paul McCartney story. And, and, and I was just thinking that there is the most amazing collection of stories here, not just albums that are made, but more stories that have happened to these bands. And that, that was that moment. It was just sitting at that, a dinner table in Fremantle. And then, you know, it all sort of started from there. Gracie, can you tell me what it was like for you directing this film in terms of the journey that you went on? Because I understand that before Cody approached you, you really didn't know squat about all this. Yeah, I mean, I would say that I didn't know anything about Michael White when I started making Last Impresario. So I kind of went in with the same mindset. And I think the thing that was always the biggest thing at the start was like, well, we don't have to worry about the third act. We know how this story ends. Um, there are so many bands that have gone down there and it's like, how are we going to find you know, the structure of the film and how are we going to work out who's, you know, whose stories we want to tell. And we were kind of lucky that it worked out chronologically in a way that was kind of a complete fluke that the bands we focused on 
you know, we ended up being able to keep that order from 79 to 89. Um, but it was, yeah, it was just kind of, you know, with anything, how we attack it, I, I was able to bring on Lawrence Horn as sound designer and Lisa Savage and Karen Johnson and Craig Deeker. So like four of the key creatives that did Last Empresario with me. Um, and, you know, that was such a collaborative film and, you know, with Cody, this was as well. So it was kind of like, you know, she wanted me to do it because I'd done Last Empresario and I was like, well, I did it, but I also did it with a bunch of other people who did great work on it. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of like bringing the team in again um, and then going, where do we start? Kind of working out maybe these are the 12 chapters and how are we going to tackle, you know, what interviews, archive, music, all of that. And then it's, yeah, snowballs. This is to both of you. What part of the filmmaking process with this film reminded you how important it is to be a little bit crazy as a filmmaker? <laughs> Um, I, I've got this great folder on my laptop, which is letters to everyone we tried to get in the film. And it's so, I go through it and it's like version five, Paul McCartney, like, you know, Sting, Keith Richards. And it's just like, dear Keith, dear Paul, you know. Um, and like, I, there's been so many moments with this film where I was like, we were totally insane. Gracie and I refused to lose. We were just like, every time people would knock us back for something, we'd be like, okay, we'll just keep trying. We'll just keep going. And I actually felt a little bit like a lunatic the whole time because also we were trying to, you know, this is a film that has a British feel to it naturally and we were trying to licence the biggest tracks of all time and we were trying to get the biggest artists in the world and the whole thing was just totally, totally mental. I don't think I felt sane ever when we were making the film. Yeah, I always said to Cody that, like, when I was finishing Last Empresario, I used to stand out the front of the post place at 5 o'clock in the morning after being there all night saying to the guy, is the film going to get finished and is it going to be any good? And he's like, yeah, it's going to be great. And I'm like, because if it is, like, I'm having the best time of my life, but I'm so stressed out now that I don't know if I'm enjoying myself. So for me, this one was different in that way that I got to, like, there was a lot less pressure on it. The film hadn't originated from my idea and it was, um, you know, kind of handed to me on a plate in, in that way that, you know, we got to travel the world and I didn't have to sleep on people's couches. Like we had Airbnbs to stay in and it was finance and, you know, it was a completely different um, thing, which was really interesting. Are you able to give me, in a nutshell, some idea of what you left out? There were some really great stories of like the people of Montserrat um, interacting even more so with the, with the locals, like the um, bartender bumped into Keith Richards in New York and ended up like going out to Connecticut with him and hanging out. And, you know, there, there was actually a lot of stories that were told that we couldn't verify factually. Um, huge ones around the Beatles. One huge thing that we were like, oh, I don't know about that. So um, we had to, in the, in the interest of saving Beatles fans from going completely manic, and, you know, because they're, they're, they're very crazy human beings at times. Um, we had to leave some of that stuff out. Um, but I think a lot of the great stories sort of found their way in. Um, there's there's a lot of BTS and little clips and such that will be released that are sort of snippets that, that weren't in the film and some really funny stuff of Gracie on the island of Montserrat as well. So right. Yeah, there's definitely stories. Like, I, you know, we love the story about Danny and, and Walk of Life and that was a hard one because, you know, Danny had said, the song was written about him, but we hadn't interviewed Martin Offley yet and he was one of our last interviews. And it was like, we wanted that to be in the film. And there's that moment in an interview where you go, how am I going to ask this? Because if he shuts me down and goes, that didn't fucking happen and that's not true, then it's like, but we're, you know, we're going, yeah. And then he, you know, verified it and it was like that huge, like, oh, thank God, like that can stay in the film. But yeah, the ones like the Beatles story was, yeah, you kind of go, yeah, there's urban legends and myths and, you know, sometimes those are worth exploring. Um, but I think with something that's also such a factual documentary, it was important that we, like, really, you know, did our research with everything. Yeah. Well, kudos to both of you for honing this thing down to 90 minutes because I imagine you probably could have made a TV series out of this. There's a lot to recommend this film, but if there was nothing else to recommend this film... The one thing to recommend this film to anybody is that golden moment where one big name musician throws a drink into the face of another big name musician. Can you guys tell us just about the gems that you found in the archives? Yeah, that's a great clip of 
the police having a huge tiff on camera. Um, I mean, have I spoken about, I've been talking a lot about the Stevie Wonder tape today, Jim. Have I told you about the Stevie Wonder tape? No. Tell me about the Stevie Wonder tape. All, I think a lot of the great archive, there wasn't really, I, I somehow with the, the, the um, archive producer, Lisa Savage, we found a way to pay for all the archive that we wanted, even though it almost killed me with heart attacks. But um, the, there was um, the tape of Stevie Wonder, which is in the film. Um, that came about because I was having a wine with my dad and he said, oh, have you, I think I've got a, um, a cassette tape of Stevie Wonder singing in Montserrat in the loft of our house in Fremantle. And so he went up there and was digging through all these boxes and he pulled out this tape that we then had to get digitised because we didn't have a cassette player at home. And it turns out to be this hour-long recording of Stevie Wonder jamming at this bar, you know, in Montserrat. And it was just one of those moments where you kind of think like, what else is up in people's attics that is undiscovered that we just, you know, yeah, heard we about? had like the archive producer Lisa tracked down someone from Elton's band and it was like their son, because I think the person had passed away. And he was like, oh, they might have tapes, but I can't go out to wherever it was in America till Christmas. And then I'll go through all the boxes and there was, you know, this big wait and then there was nothing, you know. So there were always moments like that where you kind of go, oh, my God, is this going to be like all the stuff they talked about on the island? Like, and I'm sure, you know, same happened with Last Impresario. Once the film came out, there's already been a few photos and things that people, you know, have seen the film and go, oh, I have photos down there. And you go, no, it's too late. It's too late. Were you yeah. a little disappointed that Paul McCartney really helped out with the research for this film didn't want to go on camera. I mean, we, he was. I said to Cody, like, we'd already got Sting when I started, and I said, let's aim high, go for the ace, let's go for Paul McCartney. He was, I think, on tour at the time or recording the album, so they were kind of like circle back at the end. And then, you know, at the end it was when COVID hit. Um, and there was something nice also about having Paul McCartney and Elton John and Keith Richards not in the film but seeing them in archive talking about that experience and feeling like it was obviously back in, in present day. And there's always, you know, that, that worry that you do interview someone and it's not as good as the archive. Um, so, yeah, I think it was, you know, it was great that he loved the film and he tweeted about it and he gave us some incredible home video footage. Um, but I think, you know, there was we were so lucky to get the amount of interviews we did and then when we, when we started post-production, the last part it was when COVID hit. So, Cody, can you just tell us a bit about how Rush Films is going, about what its aim was and how it's travelling. Yeah, um, Rush came about after working with other documentary producers for a number of years and then it was about, well, I really want to tell my own stories. And so Rush, by nature, it just ended up being um, a production company. All of my slate is with female directors. It's very female driven. You know, that will probably change over time, but it's just ended up that way. I collaborate really well with women and it's so diverse. I mean, I've got... Under the Volcano Music, Dark, uh, Girl Like You is about to come out on the ABC, which is about uh, a relationship um, as one person's transitioning genders. I'm working on another um, documentary project which has a porn angle to it. You know, it's just, it's everything under the sun, but it's really about just uncovering um, untold stories, I think for me is, is what I find really fascinating. And Gracie, but can you just tell us about your move into comedy? Uh, not only have you done a, a season of The Other Guy and Bump, but also you've been directing uh, a lot of sketches in The Moth Effect, which is some of the funniest stuff I've seen in a long time. Tell us a little bit about your, your comedy journey. Yeah, I mean, I always wanted to do really cinematic kind of film work and serious stuff, and then, but in nature I'm quite... A more funny person and when I did the other guy I just loved going to set and like laughing every day and telling something that was funny and so when Nick and Jazz approached me about the moth effect I really like to try things and I was like oh this is great because it's like doing 15 short films and so every day you know you have Brian Brown doing you know QAnon or Queer Eye for the Conspiracy Guy and then the next day you know it would be a completely different sketch set like 300 years ago um and it just was so great to work like I love working with actors and so great to work with comedians and people who you know especially Nick and Jazz were so great at improv um and it was just interesting going back to like a short format. Are you intending to resume your stand-up career? Um you know I think now I just I think I deleted a video off the internet 
the other day because I just kind of go, there's such a cancel culture at the moment that my, my comedy is really self-deprecating. It's about myself. So I feel like I'm in a safe zone there. But I did it in LA and I think the point of difference was that everything was different because I was an Australian in LA and that was always my angle kind of with everything. And when I started working with Matt O'Kai and I was like, I'm going to totally hang out with all these people and start doing stand up again. And and then I didn't for a year and then COVID happened. And then recently Jazz is a stand up comedian. He was saying him and his wife might get back in the circuit. And I was like, well, let's all go together. And then obviously now COVID okay. it again. So okay. yeah, maybe. But I, you know, I like directing comedians. How has COVID affected the film has it hurt the release has it hurt the film at all um i think the, the release strategy totally changed you know we premiered online south by southwest and then we wanted our you know meant to have our australian premiere at sydney it got moved we met be myth miss online um but you know it's just the whole industry is changing having to adapt so rapidly i think the beauty of it is under the volcano is going to be really accessible to people they're going to you know, listen to this interview or read this interview and then and then want to go out and watch it and they can. You know, back in the day, you had these huge windows of time before being able to do that. So, and, you know, it's a positive film. It, I hope it brings a lot of joy to people in their living room and they can enjoy the soundtrack. So it's changed the release, but like, hey, we're all living in a crazy world now. So <laughs> whatever, <laughs> well, what can you do? 